All right, folks, if you can, please find seats. If not doing so, once again, private conversations, please take outside of the chambers. We ask you to please silence all electronic devices. Any questions, please get the attention of one of the sergeant at arms. We're more than happy to help you. Thank you. Okay, good morning. I'm Councilmember Daniel Drum, Chair of the Committee on Finance. Today's hearing is being held jointly with the Committee on Aging, which is chaired by Councilmember Margaret Chin. I apologize for being late. We had a vote across the street, and uh, that was what kept me there. Uh, we have been joined by my colleagues, Councilmember Adrian Adams, Councilmember Karen Koslowitz, Minority Leader Steve Matteo, uh, Councilmember Ruben Diaz Sr., Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, uh, and that's it. Okay, good. Today the committees will conduct uh, an oversight hearing on the Department of Finance's administration of the Senior Citizen Rent Increase Exemption Program and the Disabled Rent Increase Exemption, which together make the New York City Rent Freeze Program. More specifically, the committees will examine DOF's progress in increasing overall annual enrollment and outreach for the program, as well as recent legislative and policy changes that impact the program's benefits and issues raised in various government reports. Under the Rent Freeze Program, senior citizens over the age of 62 and individuals with disabilities are protected from future rent increases by freezing their rents while providing landlords with tax abatement credits equal to the dollar value of the rent increases they are entitled to. According to DOS 2018 Rent Freeze Program report, approximately 73,299 eligible households were enrolled in the program in 2016 and receiving SCREE or DRE benefits citywide. We commend the agency for its increased efforts to target under-enrolled neighborhoods. However, even by the agency's own reporting, there remains at least 57,000 eligible households that are not yet enrolled in the program. Even though neighborhood level data was not included in the 2018 report as it was in the 2014 report, the council hopes that DOF is using this data to target its outreach for maximum effectiveness. Until all eligible households are enrolled, more work needs to be done to ensure that seniors and people with disabilities are receiving the rental assistance they need to remain in their homes. At a time where escalating cost of rent and income inequality continues to grow in the city, SCREE and DREE become even more critical housing preservation programs. In addition, at the end of 2019 state legislative session, the legislature passed the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act, which caused several changes to the administration of the rent freeze program. Notably, the state legislation allows the city to freeze rents at the preferential rent level rather than at the legal rent for the length of the tenancy. This is a welcome change, particularly because DOF noted in its 2018 report that preferential rent was one of the primary reasons that program enrollment was not higher. We look forward to learning about how DOF intends on utilizing this shift in policy to increase enrollment. Before we hear from the administration, I would like to hand it over to Chair Chin for her statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Chung. Good morning. I'm Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you to Chair Drum for his leadership in calling this important hearing on rental assistance programs for seniors and people with disability. Uh, we have also been joined by uh, Councilmember Lewis. 
Today we will hear testimony from the mayoral administration on the senior citizen rent increase exemption or SCREE programs and the disabled rent increase exemption or DRE program, which are collectively referred to as the New York City Rent Freeze Program. As chair of the Committee on Aging and a representative of many low-income and rent-burned New Yorkers, I fully understand how essential the New York City Rent Freeze Program is. I was proud to support the council's law authorizing an increase in the household income threshold to the rent freeze program to 50,000 in March of 2014. That represents an increase of over $20,000 for both programs and made thousands more seniors and people with disability eligible. However, we know that the program can still do more for more people. The statistics are sobering. On average, the SCREE participant is 73 years old and has an average household income just under $18,600. Meanwhile, the average DRE participant is 57 years old and has an average household income around $15,200. These are some of our most low-income neighbors. These neighbors rely on the rent freeze programs to stay stably housed, out of shelter, and rooted in the communities they help to build. We have, been, we have seen enrollment in the rent freeze program increase between 2014 and 2017. The data show an increase of nearly 11%, growing from 67,000 to 74,300 participants. Department of Finance deserve credit for this increase. Still, DOF's 2018 rent freeze program report estimate that only 50% of eligible households are enrolled in the program. That means there are over 57,000 households who are eligible for the rent freeze program but aren't enrolled. Today, I would like to hear a clear strategy from DOF on how to reach these vulnerable New Yorkers. In addition, we need greater accountability regarding the effectiveness of existing outreach to severely under-enrolled neighborhoods. These neighborhoods crisscross all five boroughs and include immigrant-rich areas like Flushing, Flatbush, and Highbridge, where language and cultural barriers may create obstacles that the city must overcome. Another issue to discuss is the role of the DOF ombudsperson. The ombudsperson is a recent innovation designed to help tenants resolve issues when applying or renewing rent, free, rent freeze program benefits. The two major categories addressed by the ombudsperson are related to application processing and tax abatement credits. I am particularly concerned about the large volume, some 69% of increase dealing with application processing. We need the rent freeze application and renewal process to be seamless and streamlined so that our older New Yorkers and people with disability can access their benefit with ease. I look forward to hear how DOF and its sister agencies are working to improve and streamline this process. Finally, there is an important gender and disability equity lens to this work. In November 2018, the council heard from advocates who correctly identify that the DRE program exclude caregivers of people with disability. Most of the time, these caregivers are women. Caregiving responsibility significantly impact the ability of caregivers to maintain full-time employment, which can result in a struggle to make ends meet and pay rent. Let's lift up our caregivers and honor their essential work. I look forward to hearing how DOF treats caregivers and possible action the council and our state partners may take to extend this benefit to caregivers and promote equity. I'd like to thank the Committee on Aging staff for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Danielle Krupp, our senior financial analyst, our council, Nusat Chaudhary, and senior policy analyst, Kalima Johnson. I now turn it back to Chair Drum. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair Chin. Uh, before we hear testimony, I'd like to thank the Finance Committee staff 
<coughs> excuse me, <coughs> who worked on today's hearing, Rebecca Chasen, Stephanie Ruiz, Emra Dev, Andrew Wilbur, and Luke Zangarell. Uh, we will now begin a testimony from uh, Michael Hyman, first deputy commissioner of the Department of Finance, joined by uh, B.B. Palmer, senior director of senior, of senior and disabled programs, Sheila Voyard, director of outreach, and Carl Lasky, director of the Real Property and Legal Counsel Unit in DOF's Legal Affairs Division. Representatives from the Department for the Aging and the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities are also here to answer any questions we may have for their agency. Um, so we'll begin as soon as you're sworn in by counsel. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, belief? I do. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Chin, and members of the Finance and Aging Committees for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Michael Hyman, and I am the first Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Department of Finance. As the Chair mentioned, I am joined today by B.B. Palmer, our Senior Director of Senior and Disabled Programs, Sheila Boyard, our Director of Outreach, and Carl Lasky, Chief of the Real Property and Legal Counsel Unit in our Legal Affairs Division. With us today are representatives from the Department for the Aging and the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. The Department of Finance administers the tax and revenue laws of the city, including property and business taxes and parking summonses. We value close to 1.1 million properties worth a combined market value of $1.4 trillion, and we are responsible for recording deeds and other documents associated with those properties. We also administer dozens of exemptions and abatement programs that provide billions of dollars in property tax relief to property owners and renters. One of the most important and most well-known of these programs is the Rent Freeze Program, which provides rent relief to low-income seniors and people with disabilities. The Rent Freeze Program freezes recipients' rents and protects them from future increases. Landlords receive tax credits to cover the differences between their tenants' frozen rent amount and the amount of rent that would be permitted by the Rent Guidelines Board. The Rent Freeze Program is comprised of two benefits, the Senior Citizen Rent Increase Exemption, known as SCRI, which was created in 1970, and the Disability Rent Increase Exemption, known as DRE, created in 2005. As housing costs continue to, rise, continue to rise citywide, the SCREE and DREE benefits help New Yorkers remain in their homes. Each benefit has specific eligibility requirements. For both SCREE and DREE, recipients must have a combined annual household income of $50,000 or less, and more than one-third of their monthly income must be spent on rent. To be eligible for SCREE, a tenant must be 62 or older. To be eligible for DREE, the tenant must be 18 or older and receive one of several disability-related benefits. To be approved for the Rent Freeze Program, applicants must reside in rent-regulated apartments. Currently, there are 63,018 tenants enrolled in SCREE and 12,088 tenants enrolled in DREE. Over the past several years, the Department of Finance has worked with the State Legislature and the City Council to introduce and pass legislation to make critical improvements to the Rent Freeze Program for current and future recipients. We were able to increase the program's income ceiling to $50,000 from its prior ceiling of less than $30,000. Recipients can now return to their previous frozen rent amount if a one-time income increase, such as a pension payout, causes them to be ineligible for the benefit for one year. We introduced a policy and promulgated rules providing for reasonable accommodation when a tenant did not file a timely renewal application. We have implemented a short form renewal application available to participants who have received SCREE or DREE for five consecutive benefit periods. And finally, we worked with the state to pass legislation allowing eligible household members a reasonable amount of time to submit a benefit takeover application in the event that the head of household dies or leaves the property. In addition to these changes, the Department of Finance has implemented a number of improvements to how we administer the Rent Freeze Program. We have redesigned and simplified the renewal process, resulting in a 94% approval rate during our most, most recently completed re renewal cycle in 2018. We have introduced or are in the process of introducing online platforms that allow new and renewing rent freeze program participants to review their benefits and improve their upload their documents, documentation electronically, rather than mail a packet of information or visit a Department of Finance business center. 
The online DOF Landlord Express Access Portal, known as LEAP, allows property owners to submit documents necessary for the processing of rent freeze applications. This year, DOF will be introducing an online tenant access portal, known as New York City TAP. It will provide a one-stop shop for forms, information, and resources for the scree and dree benefits. The public will be able to renew as well as submit initial applications for rent freeze program benefits. Our customers will be able to upload required documentation electronically rather than having to mail a packet of information or visit a Department of Finance Business Center. And they will also be able to check on their application status. In addition, a tenant will be able to authorize a family member or another individual to apply for the benefits on his or her behalf. We plan to deploy the renewal function in the third quarter of calendar year 2020, followed by the initial application function by the end of the year. Customers who have further questions about their rent freeze benefits are now able to speak directly with the Department of Finance employee to resolve their issues and concerns. With the launch of the new Department of Finance customer call center, rent freeze calls that 311 is unable to answer are now routed to us for immediate response. Additionally, we have cross-trained staff so that more people are capable of processing applications, thereby reducing wait times. We have also created the offices of the SCREE and DREE ombudspersons to help tenants resolve any issues when applying for or renewing benefits. The most recent updates to the rent freeze program resulted result from the passage of the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019. The state law includes several changes that impact the program. First, the cap on rent, free, rent increases for major capital improvements, or MCIs, decreased from 6% to 2%. Allowable rent increases for MCIs are covered by a tax abatement credit to the landlord. While this change affects the amount of the credit available to landlords, as the maximum amount they can receive for major capital improvements has decreased, it does not affect the rent of tenants receiving scree or dree. Another change enacted by the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act was the elimination of fuel cost charges for tenants' rents. In the past, landlords could add these changes to the rent amount and receive a credit. Again, while this will not affect rent freeze tenants, it will affect the amount of the tax abatement credits received by landlords. Most significantly for renters enrolled in or eligible for the programs, the new law stipulates that the new rent freeze applicants who have an existing preferential rent agreement and meet all program eligibility requirements can have their rent frozen at their preferential rent amount. In the past, tenants with preferential rent agreements may have not seen the benefit of applying for the program as they were already paying below market or, or below legal rent. With the change in law, these tenants will now be able to lock in their preferential rent amounts, which were previously subject to changes with the ex expiration of the lease. We expect that over the next several years, this will result in more households participating in the rent freeze program. And, we'll continue to, and we will continue to encourage tenants with preferential rent agreements to enroll. I will discuss our outreach efforts shortly. The Department of Finance is currently in the process of promulgating a number of rules for the rent freeze program. These proposed rules will provide more guidance to the public of how the program works and who is eligible. The rules will do the following. Establish the eligibility requirements for screen injury benefits based on the applicant status, household income, and who is to be considered a member of the household. Set forth the application process and applicable deadlines for rent freeze applications, as well as who may sign such applications. Establish the mechanics to determine the effective date, as well as the frozen rent for approved applications. Set forth the types of rent increases that are the responsibility of the landlords and the rent increases to be paid by the tenants. Define who is a head of household eligible for such benefits as well as the succession rights when a head of household permanently leaves an apartment. And set forth the procedures for the transfer of benefits if a scree or dree beneficiary moves from one eligible apartment to another eligible apartment. As part of this rule development and implementation process, we continue to receive and review feedback from residents and advocates. We held a public hearing on December 3, 2019, and we'll be scheduling another hearing after gathering feedback on the rules at the next meeting of the Screedry Task Force on January 29th. The task force members include senior and disability advocacy groups, neighborhood organizations, and other stakeholders who share our goal of improving and increasing participation in the rent freeze program. Since 2016, 
Enrollment in the rent freeze program, including the mitchell Lama screen benefits administered by the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, has increased from 73,299 to 75,106. It is important to note that the role that attrition plays in these figures, for example, since 2014, we have actually seen a nearly 40% increase in the number of households receiving rent freeze benefits administered by the Department of Finance. At the same time, however, many households lost their benefits due to moving, death, or increases to their income. Others failed to renew their benefits, likely for the same reasons. We do our best to counteract this attrition by enrolling and renewing as many people in the rent freeze program as we can. One of the ways we do that is with a robust and year-round outreach effort to enroll and re-enroll New Yorkers. Our outreach efforts focus on the communities where the data suggests we are most likely to find eligible rent freeze households. At the council district level, the largest rent freeze program enrollment is in Council Member Rodriguez's Council District 10, with approximately 6,200 enrollees, nearly twice as many as any other district. District 40, represented in Council Member Eugene, and District 7, represented by Council Member Levine, each have more than 3,000 rent freeze households. Districts with more than 2,000 enrolled households include Districts 1, 3, 6, 14, 25, 29, and 48, which are represented by Chair Chin, Speaker Johnson, Council Member Rosenthal, Council Member Cabrera, Chair Drum, Council Member Koslowitz, and Council Member Deutsch. In addition to getting the word out about the SCREE and DREE benefits in these and other communities, DOF's outreach team provides a full range of case management services. Staff work closely with potential applicants throughout the application and enrollment process. Much of this work is done in, at, it's done in person, at in-person events. In fiscal year 2019, we hosted or attended 471 events, an average of nine per week, nearly all of which were held in partnership with the council. We met with community and recreation centers, churches, restaurants, public buildings, anywhere else we can find space. Outreach staff even make home visits for customers who are not able to leave their homes to attend an event. All rent freeze applicants have the right to a reasonable accommodation and the agency approved 93 reasonable accommodation requests from screen injury applicants last year. We would not cover so much ground or serve so many people without help from our partners in government and the community. Our partners include our sister agencies such as DIFTA and MOPD, members of the New York City Council, the community boards, the borough presidents, and the New York City Service Bureau. We also work very closely with the mayor's public engagement unit. We meet monthly with PEU to discuss enrollment events and activities, and we rely on the support of the public engagement team, as well as our partners at Live On New York to help us staff and manage our larger events. Together, we have trained 167 community organizations to assist tenants with applying for rent freeze benefits and providing the necessary documentation. We also work with PEU and our other partners to knock on doors, make calls, and send mailings to eligible rent freeze households. We are great, very grateful to the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit and our sister agencies for their on-the-ground support. In closing, I noted earlier that more than 75,000 households currently benefit from the protections afforded by the Rent Freeze Program. Our goal is to increase that number, and we look forward to continuing to work with the Council to reach the New Yorkers who would benefit from receiving SCREE and DREE. We thank you for your continued support and for the opportunity to testify in any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much. And before we go to questions, I just want to say we were joined by Councilmember Ayala, and we are now joined also by Councilmember Keith Powers. So thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, in your testimony, you discussed the screen injury task force. So can you just tell us how many members are on the task force, and uh, how often does the task force meet? I'm going to let Sheila Boyer, who's the head of our outreach, give details. We have about uh, 25 to 30 members in the task force and we meet quarterly. Okay, and uh, what's the role of the task force? So the task force was um, instituted as a, uh, to provide a platform and opportunity for advocacy groups, industry um, groups, and also the community-based organizations to provide feedback to the um, agency on um, issues that they may be facing. So we recognize these as um, important partners in the communities because they serve um, on the ground. And so we wanted to give them an opportunity to bring issues to us so that we can um, provide policy changes and make improvements to our processes so that we can continue to get people to apply into the programs. 
So are some of the um, partners that the Deputy Commissioner mentioned also included on the task force? Yes, so Live on New York is part of our task force, um, MOPD is part of our task force, and we have a number of other industry and advocacy groups in the task force. Maybe you can get us a list of that, uh, of those members later on, please? Sure, definitely. Thank you. Uh, when DOF issued its first rent, cre uh, rent freeze report in 2014, the report um, uh, focused on the enrollment issues of neighborhoods across the city. DOF said it was going to utilize that data to um, create a targeted outreach campaign specifically for the top 10 under-enrolled neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods were the Upper East Side, uh, the Upper West Side, Stuyvesant Town, Turtle Bay in Manhattan, um, Kingsbridge Heights, uh, High Bridge, South Concourse, Throgs Neck, Co-op City in Riverdale, Kingsbridge in the Bronx, Coney Island in Central Flatbush, Crown Heights in Brooklyn, and Flushing Whitestone in Kew Gardens Park, and Woodhaven in Queens. So what specific strategies did you use to target your outreach in these areas? I think there's, there's several, several aspects that we did to, first is using data to try to figure out where the potentially eligible and underutilized uh, population exists. Uh, but I think a big part of it is just expanding not only the outreach for education, but for case, ma case management strategies. Actually working with sister agencies and other organizations, making sure that uh, tenants who are eligible for the, for the benefit uh, can be kind of assisted through the process of applying for the benefit and dealing with any documentation that might be required. So on the one hand, it was trying to get a better target population that we could focus efforts on and also provide better, a full array of customer services to help them in the process. Do you attribute those outreach efforts to um, the higher enrollments in neighborhoods? Um, and um, how do those um, enrollment rates then compare to what we see today? I can get you information on for specific neighborhoods. Overall, as I mentioned in my testimony, the number of, uh, of, of recipients of the benefits is up 40%. You know, part of what we're, you know, part of it, there's, on the other side, there is retrition in the program. But we are trying to reach out to communities where we think there is significant underutilized population and focus the efforts there. We think it has been successful. Uh, we continue to expand our outreach efforts. We're now partnering with AARP on efforts to get additional data to try to target um, potentially eligible populations. So we, we think it, there's obviously more work to be done, but we, we believe they have been successful. So Local Law 40 of 2015 required the DOF to report um, the neighborhood level eligibility enrollment data and this, in, this information was not included in the report, though the latter was um, provided to the council upon request. So did DOF ever issue and post an amended version of the 2018 report that included the data by neighborhood as required? Did we? I'll have to check. Uh, whether If not, we can look into it. Um, okay, based on the neighborhood um, based on the data that was later provided to the City Council, the following 10 neighborhoods were identified as having the lowest enrollment. Uh, Williamsbridge, Baychester, Morrisania, East Tremont, Mott Haven, Hunts Point, Kingsbridge Heights, Moshaloo, Pelham Parkway, Riverdale, Kingsbridge in the Bronx, Howard Beach, South Ozone Park, and the Rockaways in Queens, North Shore in Staten Island, and Brownsville, Oceanville, Ocean Hill in Brooklyn. Does DOF have an outreach plan to target these under-enrolled neighborhoods? And if so, um, can you distribute that to us? And uh, please describe the data that you've used instead to develop your outreach strategies. Well, the data we use is based upon, and we do have access to income data, since we do administer uh, taxes, and we do have also information to certain uh, housing and community renewal data on uh, rent stabilized apartments. So we try to look at the population that we believe would be eligible. It's uh, an estimate um, and you know while we have outreach efforts citywide, I think I mentioned my testimony, I think every council district has had a, a, an outreach event and we're always open to doing more. We are trying to focus special efforts on the communities you mentioned and part of that is by having more direct um, case management services available to potential applicants and also more targeted outreach events to, uh, to try to get as many people as possible enrolled. 
So like a neighborhood uh, like Howard Beach in South Ozone Park has um, 65 uh, recipients out of a total eligible estimated number of about 187. What do you attribute that low number to? I can't speak to that particular neighborhood, but as, as somebody mentioned, I think Chair Chin at the beginning, and as I mentioned in my testimony, we do think that the changes in the state stabilization laws with preferential rent will be a boost to enrollment in the programs that previously, even though there was a reason to enroll even prior to the change in the law, because if the preferential rent went away, you would still have a freeze on your legal rent. But now, given that the preferential rent is the legal rent, uh, we think there is gonna be an enhanced incentive for, uh, and that's one thing we're also doing in our outreach and trying to encourage people to enroll to make sure that their rents are frozen at the preferential rent level. The other factor I should say with this is that, you know, when we do these estimates of potential populations, we try to be as expansive as possible. And it could be that in certain neighborhoods, we are overestimating the potential eligible population because we don't have the complete information on household income or other factors. But we're taking the strategy that we should be as expansive as possible so that the outreach is targeted even if, you know, we're overstating potential populations that might be eligible. Okay, in the 2018 report, DOF used a new approach to estimate the program's eligible populations for rent-stabilized apartment units. Rather than using data from the Housing and Vacancy Survey, as previously done in the 2014 report, the agency instead used administrative data sources such as HCR, rent-stabilized apartment data, and IRS income data. Um, why did you make this change in methodology for rent-stabilized apartments? It's a more precise method to try to get to the population that's underserved. The housing vacancy survey data is uh, kind of summary data. It is a survey. So especially when you start getting to the community level, the reliability becomes a little more suspicious. Using direct administrative data, like income tax data and uh, HCR data that you mentioned, allows us to do a little more precise estimates of potential populations. And in fact, we did revise some of our numbers from the earlier report based on the, the, you know, the greater accuracy of the uh, new source. So in that report, I think DOF said that this is re um, still a progress, a work in progress. What did you mean by that? We're trying to look for more additional data sources. As I mentioned, we're now working with AARP, who has uh, information on income of uh, you know, their membership. So it's really trying to refine the data to be a little more accurate. You know, we think we're making improvements. We think the methodology of using the administrative data is an improvement over using HVS data, but we're still looking for other data sources that will make it more accurate. Are you considering any new approaches um, uh, for, pe for people living in rent-controlled and Mitchell Lama apartment units? Well, it's a combination of having the data try to, you know, uh, again, we, we do outreach citywide, but to look at particular neighborhoods where the underutilization may be most significant. Uh, but then I think it really comes down to new kind of processes that we're putting in place to uh, help people apply and to learn about the program. So uh, we do extensive outreach. I mentioned a few, probably only tip the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and we do believe that this summer when we launch this new tenant access portal, it'll be a valuable tool. It will be a tool that can, people can electronically upload applications and documentation with assistance of advocates and relatives. Uh, we believe that'll be helpful and it's a part of just streamlining and making the process easier. So DOF reported that the tenants with existing preferential rent agreements saw little incentive to enroll in the programs as their rent amounts were lower than the amount they would pay if their rent were frozen at the legal regulated rent. At the time of the report, only 4.1% of current SCRI and DRI recipients had a preferential rent agreement. How did DOF determine that only 4.1% of SCRI and DRI recipients had a preferential rent agreement? Uh, and is DO, uh, DOF collecting preferential rent data? I believe the data came from the HCR data that we have access to, which has uh, building and, and excuse me, apartment-specific information. Um, and as I mentioned, the big effort now is to try to encourage people with the new change in the rent stabilization law to enroll in the program. So we do expect over time that's going to go up. Do you do any um, outreach uh, on the change uh, with regard to the uh, preferential rent change in the law? 
Well, like the first step is we have issued bulletins to educate people as to what the benefit is. I think it's really more just it's incorporated into the outreach strategy. As we go out into communities, we make sure it's known to the populations that even if you have a rent preferential agreement, you're now it's definitely in your self-interest to enroll in the program. So what type of documentation would those who are receiving preferential rents need to uh, supply to you in order to uh, get the benefit of the program? Um, I believe now uh, under the rent stabilization system, the rent, I'm not sure the exact timetable, but the preferential rent is now their legal rent. So as, as they do the application, they should be stating what their legal rent is, which can be the preferential rent. Would that be included on the lease? I think, I'm not sure how it's it is. Yes. Yes. And when they, before the law went into effect, somebody who had a preferential rent would have that in, in a lease as well? Or would it state also the preferential and then the legally allowed or you know be, how that worked in the past? It would be a two-tier system. You would have your legally allowed rent, which had additional increases on top of it, and the preferential rent was an agreement between the landlord and the tenant. Okay, so with this change, do you think that DOF is going to need to update any of its systems or how would that work internally within DOF? Well, we're incorporating the changes into our current systems, and as we, you know, I think a lot of it is just in updating the outreach strategies to make sure the populations that are eligible are fully aware of it and take advantage of it, but I think our systems should be able to handle it. Okay. All right. I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Chin. She has additional questions, and then if we have time, I'll do a second round. Thank you, Chair Joe. Uh, we've also been joined by Council Member Joe Nye. Oh, and Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, DOF stated in his 2018 report that it attended or hosted for 429 events in fiscal year 2018. Uh, also state that the city uh, purchased digital advertisement on Google and Facebook uh, and then to go with print advertisement in AM New York, El Diario, and Metro New York. Additionally, DOF said that it used the agency's website and social media platform uh, to build public awareness of the rent freeze program. So how, does, uh, how did DOE determine which publication or print advertisement um, to publicize the rent freeze program? Well, they only our... focus on those few. Okay, I'll have our outreach person. Um, I don't have all the details for that, but I know that we try to um, look at local newspapers um, because we understand that a lot of the population that's not um, coming forward to apply into the programs, there may be some other reasons like a language barrier or they may not fully understand what the requirements for the programs are. So we looked at um, local newspapers um, that you know could help us um, spread the word in those communities. But also did you I mean, across the city, we have so many um, immigrant neighborhoods, and we have so many ethnic newspapers and radio station and TV station. A lot of them are free, uh, and if you buy an advertisement, you might be able to also access some of their free program. Did you utilize any of these uh, ethnic um, newspaper? So the, the marketing campaign was done at the city hall level, so um, we, we had some input in terms of um, where, it could, um, where we could advertise these, and, and um, ethnic uh, and local newspapers were definitely uh, part of the, um, the recommendations made. Um, but um, again, I don't have the full details about you know, the, the actual approach or how we reach um, those particular neighborhoods. But on a consistent basis, we reach out to ethnics and ethnic and local newspapers to advertise our en um, enrollment events um, when we're doing them in partnership with elected officials in, in certain communities that we have a partnership with that. I would add, we're happy to take any of your ideas. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's enough just to publicize um, the outreach events. I mean, you talked about at least 427 uh, events attended uh, or hosted by DOF. Do you have an idea what the number of attendees or that people show up to those events? So for fiscal year 2018, um, we had uh, over 34,000 attendees that we touch at these events. And how many, like, on average, when 
when you go to some of these events, what is the largest one and what is the smallest one? Um, well, it varies a lot the, uh, depending on the neighborhood and the type of um, promotion that it's done um, to promote the events, but um, the largest events, I would say, um, over 150 people um, we had uh, in fiscal year 2018 um, in central Brooklyn. Um, we'll do outreach events there at, at the Central Library, and uh, that event was uh, attended by well over 150 people. I think that um, you know my suggestion in terms of for a lot of the um, immigrant populations or seniors um, that do read the local paper or the ethnic paper that really take advantage of it is you do the, you publicize the event, and then when the event happened, you take a lot of pictures and you can write about it, and that's another coverage. But even just on a regular basis to engage them, it's, a lot of it is also free publicity, and especially when it's such an important government program that you should be able to take advantage of it. And really, um, next time show us some of the clippings, you know, some of the results that you're able to get. I've seen the rent freeze program advertisement on the subway in the past, but we haven't, you know, haven't seen it anymore. So sometimes the, the advertising or the program has to continue um, so that people can continue to be aware, especially um, there are new, um, you know, new guidelines or determination. There was one, um, issue that I wanted to go at is this whole redetermination. It was at another hearing that for the first time I heard uh, from, um, uh, from one of you know, the panel, he's gonna testify later, um, about that people can get a redetermination you know, if their situation changed in terms of their income. So like in fiscal year 2019, how many application uh, did DOF receive for SCREE and DRE redetermination application. Uh, how many were granted and how many uh, were rejected and why? I'm gonna ask Bimi Palmer, who's the head of our operations. Good morning. Um, I think we'll have to take that question back and um, look at our applications data, but it's definitely readily available and we can provide that after the hearing. Well, this is the this is an example of a recipient has a permanent loss of 20% or more of their combined household income as compared to the income reported in their last approved SCRI or DRE application, they may apply for a redetermination of their frozen rent by filing a redetermination application with DOF. Right, that's correct. And so to, to make the processes a little bit easier, we also um, combined the, our benefit takeover application because um, by and large, um, the redetermination, it happens in parallel with benefit takeover applications when um, one of the primary applicants passes away. Um, so on the benefit takeover application, there's simply a checkbox. So there was, we eliminated the need to file a separate application in addition, to the, in addition to the benefit takeover application. So we're just trying to make it a little bit easier um, for the process to, to be seamless. Well, that's one example, but if someone actually, you know, full-time, like a caregiver, working full-time and now they have to work part-time, or someone whose income has gone down, uh, do you publicize this redetermination? Because I, that was the first time that I heard that people can do that. And I think that makes a difference if some of the um, recipient, yeah. if their income went down, I mean went up, uh, or whatever, if they can get a redetermination, that would make a difference. Yes, a part of our uh, application redesign process that we undertook in 2016 added um, a lot of additional information to our applications, and so there's a frequently asked questions um, section which addresses redeterminations and the criteria if there's a 20% a permanent loss in income. Okay, well, I hope that, I mean, that should be something that should be publicized uh, and more. In the renewal process, um, in fiscal year 2019, how many applications did DOF receive and process for initial 
and renewal for the SCREA DREE benefits? How many were granted and how many were rejected? <laughs> and what are some of the reasons for the rejection? Okay, for SCREA initial applications in um, fiscal year 19, we received 7,392 initial al SCREA applications and sorry, uh, 1,786 DRE applications, um, and roughly 60% of those applications are um, approved. Um, part of the reason um, for the denials are um, failure to submit documentation or just simply not eligible for the program. Um, one third of the income criteria we see as probably our um, largest reason for denial, followed by um, income over 50,000. Um, some of the things that applicants um, uh, perhaps overlook is that uh, household income is is, cal is part of the income calculation. So while the, the senior or uh, persons with disability may have a uh, low income, but other um, household members uh, may have income that put them over the threshold. Um, for, you also <laughs> asked for renewal applications. So uh, uh, we processed over 25, almost 26,000 SCRI renewal applications um, and over 6,000 DRE renewal applications and the application approval rate is um, over 95%. Okay, do you have a breakdown of the long and short form renewal application? Uh, received by DOF in fiscal 2019? Yes, uh, roughly about 40% of um, renewal applicants are qualified for to use the short form renewal. 40% are using the short form? Correct. So. In your testimony, um, Deputy Commissioner, uh, you talked about, you mentioned that, and you talk about they have to have five consecutive applications. I mean, if the short form is easier, if somebody already applied, was approved, and now they're renewing it, why couldn't they just all use the short form? <coughs> well, the point of the short form is really to ease heavily the documentation mm -hmm. part of the process. So I think the, I, the idea is once you're in the program for that many periods, your income is relatively stable, your situation is relatively stable so that you know, we can comply with the law without requiring documentation that really is not going to add much value. Whereas if somebody's in the program for a shorter period of time, it can, it, the documentation is what's legally required. So part of this was part of a law change to make it a simpler process for people who are in relatively stable situations to have a short form. Well, consider moving that, <laughs> making that shorter, right? So I that doesn't have to wait five years or, or to make it as simple as possible so that more, I mean, seniors, most of their incomes are pretty stable. Um, so I think it, it really, we should definitely make the process easier. Um, now, HPD also um, do the SCRI program for Mitchell-Lama and uh, HDFC. So, what is, uh, how do you work with HPD in terms of doing the outreach? Do you also do outreach to Mitchell Lama programs and, or you just leave that to HPD or you work together? No, we do as well because we also manage the uh, DRE program for disabled individuals in those buildings. So to the extent that we have an enrollment event um, in one of these buildings, we would invite HPD to partner with us so that um, they can take on the uh, SCRI applications and then we can uh, manage the DRE applications. So we work with them to um, staff um, the outreach events uh, to these buildings. So do you have any data from HPD in terms of how effective their outreach or the number of applications that they, they process? No, I don't. We can contact them or request details. We have the number of enrollees, but the, uh, I don't know if we have details on all their outreach events. But do you have the, um, okay, so you can help us get that. Do you have the enrollee for the HPD program? Or is that part of your total program? It is part of the total. Um, I think we'll break out. Do you have that, BB? I do. Okay. 
Yeah. That's probably just the, uh, that's the total. That's the total of what that's the little happy says. We, uh, we can find it now or I can get it to you. Hmm? <laughs> I can't, I, I don't see it right off the hand. We do have that number. I will get you the total. I believe it's, uh, I don't want to guess. Do you have it? If not, you can get it back I will get back to, to us. Because I assume you work together um, on the same rent freeze program. We do, as, as uh, Sheila mentioned, especially where we're promoting DRE and SCRI as part of the one event, we do work with HPD. Um, they do administer the Mitchell Lama part of it, but we do have the data. I just don't have it at my fingertips. We'll get back to you with the specific numbers. Yeah, you're the one that administered a tax. Uh, well, we administer the, you know, tax uh, not price. the Mitchell Lama, but what we can do is get you the, uh, we can contact HPD about more details on their outreach events, but we can get you the pure enrollment number. Okay. Uh, our colleague also have questions. Okay, thank you, Chair Chin. We're now going to go to Council Member Powers, followed by Council Member Rosenthal, uh, who have questions. And I want to say we've also were joined by Council Member Moyer, and now we are also joined by Council Member Gibson. Okay, and we also have questions by Council Member Lewis after Rosenthal. My apologies. Um, nice to see everyone. Uh, thank you for coming in and testifying on this incredibly important topic. I guess I want to start by just sort of making sure I understand uh, what's happening with three and three. Am I right in understanding that the state will have to renew um, July? in July 2020, the current increase to 50,000. That's correct. And um, will, I guess I have two questions with that. Will the city be, do you, do you have any concerns that the state might not um, renew? I mean, it's on our legislative agenda. I think we should all be pushing for it. I don't have any reason to believe the state wouldn't extend it. I mean, you know, a lot of part of the tax law is sunset, and the state likes the thrill of extending our laws. But I think since it's a city-funded program, um, I, I, we just need to be active to make sure they right. do it. When did it become a city-funding program? Wasn't it state, didn't the state cover the increase for one moment in time? They did for one moment in time. Uh, so basically, when it was first increased to 50,000, and the legislation that did that, did, it did have a provision that the state would cover the uh, cost for the um, increase in, uh, in, uh, in city costs or increased program costs. But this, in the subsequent year, as part of their budget, they included a one-time dollar amount they gave the city, and then they just continued funding. And in fact, that dollar amount, I believe, was much lower than the actual cost to the city. But now it's, it's, it's no longer any state reimbursement. Um, and do you have a sense if the money is in the budget? Well, I think the baseline the, expectation is that yeah. the 50,000 ceiling will continue. Yeah. And I think this question was already asked, but if you could just uh, remind us, how much does the city spend in the increment? on the increment, that'll have to get you. I have the total program costs from our tax expenditure report, but let me get back to you to the okay. components. Thank you. Let's start, what's the total cost again? Let's find the document. Uh, well, I think it's, I don't wanna guess. Let me get back to you. I don't want to give you an imprecise number. I do have the tax expenditure estimate with me. I'll find it. Okay, thank you. Oh, here it is. Oh. Okay. So the SCREE cost in fiscal 19 was 142 million, and DRE uh, was 25 million. Hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering about the tenant um, access portal. Mm -hmm. Is that currently accessible to people with disabilities? It, um, well, it's gonna be launched in the summer. Sorry, But it yeah. will be ADA compliant. Um, so we're, we're, and we're reviewing issues now to make sure that it is. 
Um, so when it's, it's launched in the summer, we expect it to be ADA compliant as well as just generally uh, available to the public. So as I've learned about ADA compliant, that bar is really low. Um, so what I'm wondering is if you're going to be, what your interaction is going to be with the mayor's office of people with disabilities, whether or not you're going to be, uh, you know, having people with a range of disabilities come in and beta test it. I'm, I'm wondering, is your commitment to the ADA level or is your commitment to actually making it work for people with all different kinds of disabilities? Well, we're going to be working with MOPD to go through the issues. I don't have specific answers, but we are going to go through. I mean, it could be one of the issues that we're going to talk to them about what they see as the main needs so that we can uh, launch on, you know, in the summer and then we can also enhance it over, over time. But uh, the first step is just to get their feedback. Right. So right now, for, for me, that's an inadequate answer. Mm -hmm. um, I think what I'd like to see, and if, if we could include this in our questions and assume you can get back to us with the, um, your roadmap for how you're going to beta test this for people with all different kinds of disabilities and a commitment to go above and beyond the very low bar of ADA requirements. I, I think, as you mentioned, if you give us the question, we'll consult with MOPD and we'll get back to you and try to show you our plan. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm looking for a little bit more than consulting with MOPD. Dep I'm looking for taking their advice and running with exactly what they're asking for uh -huh. and I would like to see the roadmap of how you're doing that before the summer's implementation. This is just too important for people with disabilities. You make a very good point and I, you know, at this point I like to say is we understand that the commitment needs to be there but we also do need to go through the mechanics and understand the specifics. So. I think as you suggested, if you give us the question, we'll get you back and then you can respond to our comments. Have I sufficiently given you the question? I mean, as you just said, if you wanted a roadmap of what we're doing, I need to go back and consult with MOPD sure. and our own people. Sure. Is, is that sufficient? Do you need to get a letter from me or oh, no. okay. this is good? That's I, I just know we usually get questions afterwards, but I hear your This point. is the question. Gotcha. Okay. We'll transcribe. Thank you. Um, and then I just want to confirm for people with disabilities, the current amount, uh, or if we were, if the if the fifty thousand dollar number were to sunset, what would it go back to for people with disabilities? What call? The old amount. What was the old amount? I'm just going to give you the specific amounts. Do you have that? It was around 20 and 29 estimate, but. Right. Based on the eligibility for Social Security. Um, which I think is 9,000 maybe. Okay. Um, so I'm just, I, I just want to double down on the critical importance for people with disabilities that we maintain the minimum income at $50,000 um, in order to make sure that they're getting the, the rent coverage they need. No, we agree to fully. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you. Councilmember Lewis followed by Councilmember Gibson. Good morning, everyone. I have two quick questions. Um, we, you spoke a lot about the tenant portal and the customer service center. So I wanted to know if you could describe the particular forms of outreach that will be used to inform residents of those two programs and if they would be provided in different languages. Uh, 
Um, so our um, enrollment events are all service enrollment. So when we meet with applicants, we try to let them know about all of the uh, programs and um, uh, or uh, yeah, the, all the programs that we have available for them. So the enrollment events are definitely one way that we're doing that. We also uh, will be putting that on our um, website. Um, we also do social media um, promotion for um, these initiatives once we launch. Um, and also in partnership with the elected officials, we run a program called the, train, the Trainer Program where we um, we train um, council staff and other elected official staff um, so that they could they could be aware of these uh, changes or new programs that we implement. So we are also will also be counting them uh, on the council and other elected officials um, to help us uh, spread the word, um, and we'll be getting them up to speed at the uh, train the trainer um, initiatives that we have. So there's no other form of marketing campaign that will be done for the program starting later in the year. So the the um, tenant access portal, as we mentioned, is going to launch in um, in in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, so between now and then, we are still working out the details of the program and also how we're going to um, outreach um, to promote um, this uh, to the tenants. Um, we also have inserts and or uh, letters that we send out to the screen injury recipients um, on a monthly basis. Um, we will also be included information about this new uh, program uh, or this new system for them in these inserts so that the current applicants will have knowledge of it. But we are still working out the um, details on how what other ways we are going to promote this to the population that perhaps is not in the in the program just yet. Um, but we expect that again, outreach events are going to be a, a big part of it, our Train the Trainer initiatives. We also have a network of about 167 uh, community-based organizations that we work with. So we would also get them involved in this process and we'll be counting on these partners to help us um, get the word out um, for these uh, programs as well. Thank you. And were you able to implement the recommendation of the ombudsperson from the 2018 report? And if so, what were the issues um, with implementing any of those recommendations? Do you have the specifics of the recommendations? No, I'm asking because that was what was presented to us. So there were recommendations that they provided I wanted to know if you guys ever implemented those recommendations, and if so, did you have any issues with that? I think we have to get back to you with a response to your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have questions now from council member, or I should say, a chair of the subcommittee on finance, chair. Uh, Gibson, followed by Councilmember Vallone. Thank you. Thank you to our, our Chair of Finance. Thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Chin, who's always a champion for our uh, elders and seniors. Thank you so much for being here today. And I represent Bronx County, and so I, I certainly had to ask a question looking through your testimony in terms of the four of the five boroughs that saw an increase in enrollment um, from 2014 to 2016, I wanted to understand a little bit more of the uh, root causes of why the enrollment for both Scree and Dree uh, decreased for Bronx County. Uh, and many of my colleagues asked about the ongoing outreach efforts and my office uh, has certainly been a partner with the Department of Finance and the Department of Aging. Um, and certainly I offer as a Bronx Council member to help in making sure that residents in the borough of the Bronx, seniors and those who have a disability are applying for SCREE and DRE. Um, and so I certainly encourage you, as many of us do, we visit senior centers all the time. Seniors are out there, and many of them know about screen injury, but some of them just don't apply. Um, and so I want to understand the outreach efforts. How can we get them to apply? I would love to see the Department of Finance physically in senior centers more. I think that would be great. Uh, seniors are also at churches a lot. We go to church all the time. And that's another outlet where you can find many uh, residents as well as community centers. Um, I think for all of us, we have to be creative. We have to meet seniors where they are. And if we can do that, I think you, you would see the numbers turn around. So I just wanted your thoughts on why you thought and believe that there was a decrease in the Bronx and screen injury. 
I don't know specifically, but you're raising a lot of good points. I mean, I do think that part of it is reaching people where they are most likely to be located. And I think one of the big uh, changes and uh, changes and enhancements to outreach in recent years has been more of a case management approach. So if people are confused by the process at all or they need information, they have more of a person who will walk them through the steps in the process rather than just giving them so-called education. Um, so I think we, we just need to consult more. And, and, and you had great ideas of how to expand outreach. Um, but I don't know specifically. I don't know if anyone have any idea on the Bronx per se. I don't know if we have a specific answer to why Bronx declined, other than, as you said, the more important issue is strategies to, to reverse that and to increase enrollment. Okay, so I have a suggestion. Um, many of our senior providers all have contracts with DIFTA. Um, we could try to form a working group in the Bronx. We can work with organizations like RAIN, Neighborhood Shop. Presbyterian Senior Services, Mid Bronx, Hope of Israel. These are all senior centers that really encompass the Bronx. They have multiple locations all throughout the borough and across all communities. And working with those senior center directors on more outreach efforts in the centers, I think that would be a great place to start. And then secondly, um, working with organizations like AARP, and many others live on New York. They have members that come from the Bronx and they make their presence known here during budget time every year. And I think if they understood that there was a challenge that we faced in the Bronx and we needed to get more clients enrolled in the program, I think you would see a more robust effort. But I think what we would appreciate as elected officials is we're happy to work with you, but certainly we would expect the administration to take the lead and the city council will partner with you. Um, and then also on the other angle, I served as a, an assembly member, so I certainly know how Albany works. And as you prepare your advocacy in Albany to make sure that the legislation, the law rather, is uh, reauthorized, um, certainly the earlier the better. I do not want this languishing until June. Um, understand that the legislature is going to leave earlier this year. They're not working the third week of June. They're going to leave the first week of June. Um, and so I don't want us to wait until the last minute because this is important and it has to be on the radar of our legislators in Albany. And certainly the city council will work with you. We're putting together our council priorities um, as it relates to the state agenda. Um, and I th certainly think that this will be one of those items on it because I think we were very, very happy when we raised the threshold to $50,000 because it does recognize for many seniors, particularly a couple that has a substantial retirement and pension, they're not rich. And we need to recognize that as the cost of living increases, we have to adjust that eligibility as such so that many of those clients that are right at the cusp or a little bit over uh, remain eligible for the program. Um, what I would also love to see, I, I'm full of ideas, I would love to see as the administration does around universal pre-K, 3K, Vision Zero, and Thrive NYC. These are major signatures, and you see them in public service announcements, subways, bus station, bus shelters. You see them on the NYC kiosks. So we should also be making sure that we promote screen injury on the kiosks. Everyone uses kiosks, young people, everyone. And I think if we continue to promote it, then people will start to understand that the program is available to them. I think a lot of seniors don't necessarily think they're eligible and there's a hesitancy on, a, on applying for it. But I always say, even if you think you're not eligible, apply anyway, because you never know. Um, and that's been my message and the message of my colleagues. So I would love to work with you, the Department of Finance and DIFTA, on how we can get the enrollment numbers up, particularly in Bronx County. Okay. Okay, thank you. thank you. I'm full of ideas today. Okay. Thank you so much. Looking forward to working with you. And thank you to all of the advocacy groups who always make sure uh, that the city council understands the importance of programs like Screen Injury that would really not only freeze their rent, but continue to provide them with affordable housing, as we know is so desperately needed in the city. So I thank you all. And thank you to our chairs. Thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Chen. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair Gibson. And uh, before you got here today, we had a little bit of a discussion around the Scree Injury Task Force. Would you be able to tell us how many members of the task force might come from the Bronx? 
Um, I don't have the details on that right now, but we can get you that. Okay, so that would be really important to the discussion, and I think that having some representation there um, for those underserved com communities is really very important. So we'll follow up with that. Um, we have questions now. Uh, before I say that, let me just say we've been joined by Council Members Deutsch and Traeger, and now we have questions from Council Member Vallone, and then uh, if we have a second round, followed by Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you very much to both of our chairs, and good morning to our amazing advocates. Always the best in the city when we fight for our seniors. So I see in the testimony, Commissioner, some really important information. Um, one of my rallying cries for almost 30 years of doing elder law is making sure my seniors have the person able to represent them, and most do not. So whether it's a simple document, a power of attorney or something, but you put in your testimony an interesting um, comment when you're going to release the tenant access portal that a family member or another individual to apply for benefits will be able to do so on his or her behalf. How is that going to happen? Well, we feel it's also important that a senior citizen has assistance when they need it in order to, you know, to navigate the process. I think as part of the portal, there will be, um, and, and, and uh, I'm not, I don't think it needs the power of attorney. I think it's gonna be an authorization for someone to allow someone to um, fill out information, submit information on their behalf. But I have to, of course, I'm not sure. Do you know offhand, Carl, the legal aspects? We'll have to get back to you with the actual legal parts of it, but basically, as a mechanical thing, when you sign up on the form, you can authorize someone to be your, the person that will submit information for you and also receive information back from us for any follow-up questions. Well, no, that, that would be a tremendous benefit, but, but understanding that process also has to be done correctly so we can get the information correctly out on how to do that, how to designate someone. Will that person be in conflict with the power of attorney? Will the power of attorney trump the person whose authorization? Obviously, one of the lawyers remaining on the council. These are the things that pop into my head. So we have to flush that out. I also want to make sure that we utilize that. That's a wonderful tool if it's done correctly, if we can get that authorization for someone to help them with the portal and be that designated person so that we can go into the centers, we can be the voice and explain, okay, all you have to do is fill out this authorization and I as your son or you as the spouse or you as the guardian can now assist a senior. But we, we definitely have to be clear on that process right. so we can get that. So we can flush that out and work on it? Yes, and we can also um, walk you through the process before it's actually uh, released so they get your feedback on it. So maybe it might be useful to have like um, a, a session with your staff or to kind of go through issues and walk through the mechanics of the process and give you a demo of the, of the new uh, system. Well, the process is one thing, but my question to you was whether the authorization is going to be online or as a power of attorney. No, will so once be, you get the answer to that, right, then I'll I can get you back to, to the answer to that question. Perfect. And then I have just two quick questions on intro 397. So um, the co-chairs and I, we have a bill. We're trying to make it a little easier. So intro 397 requires that the administration of SCREE and DRE, including for the Mitchell Lama and HDFC apartment units, which are currently administered by HPD, be transferred to the Department of Finance. Does the Department of Finance support that change? We have no current plans to do that. I think that's something that would have to be analyzed, both from an operational point of view and for what best serves the customers. So um, we can look into it. We don't have a position, and uh, there's nothing on the table on our end to try to uh, move the uh, Mitchell-Lama scree into DOF, but it's something that can be analyzed and looked at for cost-benefit analysis, and also, most importantly, what will serve the uh, recipients the best. Well, clearly that's the plan, and I think we're going to have to come up with a plan because the bill is moving. So the bill is going to require it one way or another, so I would suggest that we get a position so that we can better tailor the bill so that it's not creating an unduly burdensome. We want to make this, as always, more streamlined and a better process. So um, with the bill being uh, taken out to the hearing, you can expect it to move forward, so we should get an answer on that. Any word from HPD on what they may be, take a position on that? I don't have, I don't know right now, but that's something we'll have to consult with them. Okay. Thank you to both my co-chairs. Thank you, Council Trim. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, 
I just want to circle back to something to make sure I really um, understand what's going on. So it's my understanding that the current DOF proposed rules, as currently written, go back to um, go back to the original SSI limits below the fifty thousand. And I I just want to know is DOF prepared to amend those rules as soon as when if hopefully the, they will, the state renews uh, the legislation July 1st. A legal person. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely, we'll amend it depending on what the state does. I believe currently the rules do provide for the 50,000 threshold at this point though. Um, now let's go back and double check that. It's my understanding that as currently drafted, they go back to the old limits at that date. So it's just worth triple checking if that's right. okay. Absolutely. Um, so, and then just to triple check about what you're planning to do uh, to make sure these laws are renewed, in addition to it being part of your legislative agenda, do you have specific actions that the Department of Finance or the administration is planning to do to engage the state legislature and how can the city council be helpful? Getting back to council member Gibson's question. I think, well, I think we're all supportive of the extension. As far as strategy, we're gonna have to defer to our intergovernmental affairs office for the best, but then I think part of it is working with the council to make sure to show the state legislature that there's a united city effort. Um, but um, we'll have to defer to our IGA people. That's great, and I mean, I think the reason, I think those two questions go hand in hand in the sense that if our language uh, currently reverts it back, it sort of shows a willingness to go back. And so my hope is, is that the way the language is written, it assumes it'll go forward. We're triple checking. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you, chairs. Okay, thank you. We're going to go back to Chair Chin. Okay, thank you, Chair. I have a question uh, in terms of the, um, in fiscal year 2019, the mayor's management report, the MMR, it was reported that the average time to process scree and DRE applications increased in three categories. Uh, scree initial application processing increased by two days, DRE initial pro application processing increased by 1.3 days, and uh, DRE renewal application process increased by 0.7 days. So according to DOF, the increase in application processing was attributed uh, to the merging of the SCRI and DRE with the Senior Citizen Home Owners Exemption Program, the SHE program, and the Disability Homeowner Exemption um, Processing Unit. So how many staff members are currently working in the processing unit? So currently we have um, 20, 20 uh, processors that have been cross-trained um, in processing all senior and disabled programs. Um, and so what that has allowed us to do is during peak periods, be able to, um, to have a, a team that would be able to um, handle increases in volumes of applications. So do you anticipate um, the application processing time to improve for fiscal year 2020? Absolutely, they already have. Already have? That sounds good. So means that seniors don't have to wait three more days and people with disability don't have to wait extra days to get processing. Absolutely. So you think we could push that back? Oh, it's actually going back. So right now, currently, um, for initial and renewal applications, we're at about five days to, to receive a, a first determination. So before, in the last report, it was increased by three days, so people had to wait eight days. Right, so it, it's, it's... Now you're back to the regular. It, it's showing a downward trend, yes. Okay, 
that's, that sounds good, because otherwise we would have to <laughs> advocate for more staff for you during the budget process. <laughs> okay, uh, so also how many um, in your, how much are you spending on developing the uh, tenant access portal? What, what's, what's the budget for that? Well, it is an in-house effort, so we'd have to look to see. It's not like there's additional budget funding for it. It's done by our current IT and operational staff. Um, I can get you more specifics, but uh, it's not like an additional budget cost. That sounds good. Okay. One of those rare items. <laughs> um, and then lastly, uh, since I chair the Committee on Aging, of your 420-some events, how many of those are done in senior centers or NORCs, Natural Occurring Retirement Community? I don't have the exact numbers, but we do um, a number of them at uh, NORCs. Uh, the senior centers, uh, the prior fiscal years, we used to do a lot at senior centers, but found that you know that population is highly saturated already. They already have knowledge of the program, and then DIFTA also contracts with uh, service providers at those centers to provide um, information and enrollment assistance to those folks. So in terms of uh, best u uh, utilizing our resources, we have been working with the NORCs and at other locations, as mentioned in the testimony earlier, um, to find those um, um, uh, eligible population that need additional help but don't have um, that help as the senior centers have. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Just a few more follow-up questions. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you have access to income information uh, because you administer income taxes. To what extent are you permitted to use that data for screen DRE or for other programs outside of income tax administration? That's a very good question. We, we, there are real restrictions, especially when we're using IRS data, because we don't want to lose access to our IRS data. So we can use it for general uh, summary data level uh, analysis. We're not able to use it directly to say, if your income of this person's X, we can go to that person and say, we looked at the IRS data. So we basically use it to try to target neighborhoods and smaller geographical areas, but there are restrictions on, on the use of the data. Okay. Uh, according to DOF's website, the agency will open temporary assistance center in Queens and one in Brooklyn from January to March 2020 to provide assistance to individuals looking to learn and apply to the rent freeze program. Uh, what led DOF to decide to open these centers? I'll give the general. Uh, generally, uh, you know, we're trying to target the periods of, of greatest utilization and the areas where we see the need for the resources is somewhat also like a pilot. We'll see how it works. But I think it was really because that is a key period for not only SCRI but applying for SHAHI. Uh, so part of it was to um, have resources available in the peak periods. Do you have translation services available at those locations? Yes, we have a number of staff members that speak um, other languages, and then we also use Language Line to provide language services to anyone that doesn't, um, that's not able to uh, speak English, but also um, understanding that they uh, they need the services in their language. So we do. And what about uh, opening centers in other boroughs like the Bronx, Brooklyn, and I guess Manhattan? So we currently already have services uh, year-round in Manhattan and also in Staten Island. Uh, the satellite offices are open in Queens and Brooklyn during the peak periods like um, Michael mentioned. And so the other uh, areas are highly supported by the outreach events um, that we, we host um, to bring the services locally to the uh, applicants. Okay. Uh, according to the 2019 annual report of the screen injury Onsbud person, in July 2019, DOF launched a customer contact center for SCRI and DRE participants to speak to live representatives regarding their benefit and application status inquiries. How many inquiries has DOF received to date at the contact center? It has been a highly successful vehicle for resolving issues that um, 311 can't uh, resolve. Uh, unless, does somebody have that data readily available or we can get back to you? Do you have it? Yeah, no, we'll, we'll get back to you. Okay. Um, and do you have any idea what types of inquiries are coming in? Um, and are there any trends or, um, you know, um, constant questions that you're getting about the programs? 
I don't know offhand or do you, Sheila? I mean, generally the questions are always the, on the status of the application. If they have not heard from us, they want to know where they are in the process. Um, so that's usually the number one question. But outside of that, um, seniors generally have particular issues going on in their household. So this avenue provides an opportunity for them to be able to explain or let us know of any household situations that are not covered in the application. So the customer services uh, center is able to help in those uh, regards. Okay, so if somebody contacts um, 311 in the hours between like 8.30 and 4.30, uh, they're transferred to the contact center. What if they contact 311 with questions about the contact center or for the contact center outside of those hours? How is that handled? Um, I'm not entirely sure what happens after hours. Um, 311 has access to our basic system for um, finding out uh, case-related information, so they can provide basic information as to the status or any uh, documents that we need to complete the application process. But I'm not sure um, what happens after our... Hmm? So it's a voicemail service. So they leave, service. can leave a message? Yeah. So Do you know how many messages they can accept? That I'm not sure. Okay, because we'd like to know that also. Okay. So maybe you can get back to us on that as well. Okay. I actually think that's about it, and we're going to um, thank you for coming in and giving testimony. We'll follow up with uh, written questions later on. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to call up our next panel. Thank, thank you. you. Rocky Chin from AARP. Uh, Kim Lesnar, Live On New York. Peter Kempner. Volunteers of Legal Service, Alex Riley, Legal Aid Society, and Christopher Evans, Legal Aid Society. Okay, should we start here with Rocky Chin? Uh, good morning, uh, Chairpersons Chin and Drum, and I want to also um, thank uh, <coughs> City Council Member Rosenthal and Valone for being here. I know there are other council members here. Um, my name is Rocky Chin, I'm a member of ARP, New York's Executive Council, and we have a good number of our members here today braving the cold weather. We always do want to show up at these events. So thank you for having this oversight hearing. On behalf of our nearly 750,000 members age 50 and older in New York City, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify at this rent freeze on the rent freeze program. And as we've heard, uh, there's a lot happening and uh, we intend to continue to be also the voice of uh, 50 plus in making sure these things are followed through, so thank you. Uh, seniors are a growing group that is extremely challenged by rising costs in a well, is a well-known fact. A report commissioned by ARP with the Center for an Urban Future found the number of older adults in New York City increased 12 times faster than the city's under 65 population, and that group is more diverse than ever. Immigrants now account for 50% of New York City's 65 plus population. Many older New Yorkers are living on fixed incomes and having trouble paying their rent. Multiple ARP surveys show that affordability is indeed a major concern for older New Yorkers. 54% of respondents to one ARP survey reported housing affordability as a major concern. That number shot up to 67% among Hispanic respondents, 62% of boomers and Gen X respondents expressed anxiety over their ability to afford housing in the future. And 61% of Gen X and boomer voters said they are considering 
leaving New York State to retire somewhere else because of the lack of affordability. Last year, AARP New York teamed up with the Asian American Federation, Hispanic Federation, NAACP, and the Urban League to release a report titled Disrupting Racial and Ethnic Disparities, Solutions for New Yorkers 50 Plus. One of the key findings was that the quote unquote cost burden status of older African American, black, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Hispanic, and Latinx New Yorkers, and their vulnerability to gentrification and displacement. As the city's population continues to age, these concerns are likely to grow. We need to use all the tools we have, tools we have to ensure we have appropriate and affordable housing for older New Yorkers now and in the future. So that's why we also are thrilled when the income eligibility for SCREE and DRE was raised to 50,000, making thousands of more households eligible for the program. Furthermore, the Housing Stability and Tenant Protections Act of 2019 incentivized many more individuals to apply for the program. But according to the 2018 report by DOF, the enrollments in SCREE is just over 50%. And of course, we've heard all the questioning as to why that is so low. Clearly, much more needs to be done. And we'd like to add our vast number of volunteer ARP members to join with the city council and our elected officials in increasing that number. We'd like to express our support for measures that would allow tenants to apply for SCREEDRI at any point throughout the year, as opposed to wait awaiting the next lease renewal. That should help. However, other proposed measures concern us, include, including limiting who could act as a tenant representative in order to assist tenants with the application process and limiting tenants to only one SCREE DRE application per year. There are many people who can and need to act as tenant representatives and many reasons why a person can be denied, including mistakenly submitted incomplete applications. We shouldn't penalize qualifying SCREE DRE applicants for needing help or making mistakes in the application. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. We'll go to the next uh, person on the panel and then come back for questions. Thank, Thank you. you. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs Chin and Drom and the full committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kim Lerner and I'm the program director for Live on New York's Benefits Outreach Program. For over the 40 years, Live on New York has been supporting community-based organizations throughout the city that provide core services to older adults to allow them to thrive in their communities. With the base of more than 100 community-based organizations, Live on New York's members provide services including senior centers, congregate and home-delivered meals, affordable senior housing, caregiver supports, NORCs, and case management. Through policy efforts, Live on New York advocates to increase funding and capacity for our members to meet the needs of older adults in their communities. To better support older adults and our members, Live on New York also administers a citywide benefits outreach program that assists older adults in the communities where benefits are most underutilized. Through this program, we educate thousands of older New Yorkers each year, including those who are homebound, and screen and enroll those who are eligible for SCREE, DRE, and a number of other benefits. Our team works tirelessly to help older adults through the application and re-enrollment processes, and witnesses firsthand the positive impacts of these programs. DOF and their wonderful staff has been an incredible partner, particularly in our work with SCREE and DRE, and it is because of this partnership we would like to provide testimony today. First, we are grateful for the, program these, for the support these programs have received from both the administration and the City Council. In 2014, through a joint city and state effort, the income eligibility for SCRI and DRE, as we've talked about, was raised from 29,000 to 50,000. As a result, thousands of more households were eligible for the rent freeze program. While the enrollment rate has increased since the eligibility increase, a 2018 report by DOF indicated that the overall enrollment rate in 2016, in 2016 was only 56.2%. For this reason, continued and increased outre outreach efforts are necessary. 
the importance of early awareness of the benefit cannot be overstated, as the SCRI and G programs are unique in that their benefits compound over time. Said another way, the earlier an individual enrolls in the program, the more they will benefit from it. And most importantly, SCRI plays a critical role in allowing older adults to age in place. Most recently, Live on New York was thrilled to advocate for and see the passage of the new preferential rent laws in the Housing Stability and Tenant Protections Act of 2019. Previously, those with preferential rent were disincentivized from enrolling in SCRI as their rent would be frozen at the market rate, oftentimes increasing a tenant's rent by hundreds of dollars. With this new law, preferential rent amounts have been made permanent and must now be treated as the new legal base rent for that unit. This protection now incentivizes many more individuals to apply for the rent freeze program, and therefore outreach efforts must be strengthened and reinvigorated to bring awareness to this beneficial change. Last fall, DOF proposed a number of amendments to SCREE and DRE. Live on New York viewed most of these changes as positive, such as improving the process of succession rights and allowing tenants to apply for SCREE or DRE at any point throughout the year, as opposed to waiting to the next lease renewal. However, there were a few, there were a number of recommendations that were cause for concern. Live on New York was particularly worried about DOF limiting those who may be deemed a tenant representative in order to assist tenants with the application process. Many of these individuals in need of the SCREE or DREE program already face significant barriers to the application process. And the job as advocates, such as ourselves, is to walk them through the process successfully. For this reason, Live on New York believes that the provision should include anyone listed as a tenant representative, as consistent with other benefit applications of the city. Another um, proposed amendment would limit tenants to only one SCREE DREE application per year. We believe this proposed change would be particularly harmful to the many tenants who are eligible for the program but are denied due to mistakes on the application or the inability to compile the required documentation. <clears throat> Our team has helped a number of individuals successfully reapply for the program after having it first been denied due to an incomplete or incorrect application. Because time is of the essence in this program, as previously stated, this rule would effectively penalize tenants for making errors on applications by not allowing them, by not allowing them to reapply for another year. Livon New York was grateful for the opportunity to provide feedback to DOF on these proposed changes to screen and tree, and we are hopeful that the recommendations outlined will be given serious consideration in advance of the final rule promulgation. Livon is committed to working with our partners at DOF, DIFTA, and all city agencies, as well as members of the City Council, to provide outreach, education, and enrollment assistance to New Yorkers in need of this critical program. We look forward to our continued partnership and outreach opportunities as we ensure that every tenant who is eligible for this program receives its full benefits. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Next, please. Good morning. My name is Peter Kempner, and I'm the legal director and elderly project director at Volunteers of Legal Service. Our elderly project conducts regular free legal clinics at senior centers and NORCs uh, around the city. We provide technical support to community-based organizations serving low-income seniors by answering legal questions their clients face. We provide training to community-based organizations and seniors uh, regarding proper end-of-life planning. Uh, we publish an advocate's guide to SCREE, a guide to burial assistance and funeral planning for New Yorkers in need, and we access the pro bono legal services of the private bar by training, supervising, and pairing them up uh, with low-income seniors uh, seeking to have their life planning documents done, drawn up and executed. Uh, this allows seniors uh, who can't afford to hire an attorney to get powers of attorney, healthcare proxies, living wills, wills, and other advanced directives uh, done free of charge. And, and as Council Member Vallone pointed out, these documents, especially the power of attorney, are critical for seniors to be able to access benefits, uh, including screen and DRE, to allow them to stay in their home and, and be able to age in place with dignity and respect. Uh, we, we thank the Council uh, um, Committees on Aging and Finance for ho holding this hearing today. Uh, aside from needing advanced directives, which is our, our core work, the, the seniors who are coming to us at our, at our senior centers and our clinics 
uh, the number one issue they face is, is housing instability. And, and scree injury really allows them to afford the rent after they see a huge drop uh, in income after retirement. Uh, without scree injury, the city would face an exasperated homelessness crisis among the elderly and disabled, and we must do everything in our power to not only preserve uh, and extend these, the outreach of these programs, but also to make improvements uh, that will strengthen and advance the goals of ensuring that the elderly and disabled New Yorkers could age in their communities. One of the major limitations right now of the screen injury programs are that it's limited to seniors and, dis and the disabled who live in rent-regulated apartments. For many who reside in smaller buildings or in newer construction, the result is that the exact kind of housing instability that was trying to be avoided by these programs. They're, they're not eligible to receive the rent freezes uh, and therefore they're subject to their landlord's rent increases at any time. Extending the rent freeze programs to tenants of unregulated units can accomplish uh, the goals of, of of housing stability for these populations, and we could set maximum rent guidelines much along the lines of what is already being done uh, in Section 8 voucher programs and other rental subsidy programs. Uh, and so this extension could also bring thousands more people housing stability. Another limitation is the absence of retroactivity of the applications uh, for the programs. As pointed out by, by Live on New York, these things do count, compound over time, and sadly, we know that many seniors don't learn about their SCREE eligibility for years, if not decades, after they've first become eligible. And their rent has increased greatly over that period of time. To be able to retroactively apply the rent freeze to when they first became eligible for the program would greatly benefit them, it, the ability to roll back, uh, would put money back into the, pro into the pockets of low-income tenants who often live benefit check to benefit check every month. Uh, the other thing about the SCREE injury program that actually differs from a lot of the other rental subsidy programs is that there isn't a cap on how much rent somebody pays relative to their, to their income. Um, right now, what the law says is that somebody will pay uh, no less than 30% of their income or the amount of the, of the last rent um, before they become approved. And so this results in many people paying 50, 60, 70, 80% of their income towards their rent instead of putting a cap instead of a, a, a floor of 30% for, for these programs. It's really the opposite of what we see in other rental as assistance programs like Section 8, public housing, HASA recipients, and others. Uh, where tenants' share is capped at 30 percent. And so that would, again, make a huge difference. We have certainly seen many seniors at, at our clinics that say, why should I bother getting SCREE? I, my rent is already, you know, well over what my income is, and, and they don't benefit from this at all. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is um, that with respect to what Councilmember Chen was talking about as, as far as redeterminations are concerned. Um, when, for instance, one member of a, a married couple passes away and there's a huge loss in income, at the next recertification, that household is putting their income um, to the Department of Finance. Department of Finance should, should immediately flag to say, this is more than a 20% drop and not require a separate form. And I understand what the administration is saying when there needs to be a transfer of head of household from the person who is deceased to another spouse um, who is left, but oftentimes it's sometimes just another family member who passes away and not the head of household, and they won't be putting in that form uh, to transfer for who is, is primary on the benefit. A and so instead, at every at every redetermination, at every recertification, if the Department of Finance flags that there's a 20% more drop in income, they should make an automatic redetermination instead of putting the onus on the low-income elderly and disabled New Yorkers who are putting in applications and, and, and recertifications for this application, for this benefit rather, to be on their shoulders. It should be on the shoulders of the agency instead. Um, and so I think with these improvements, we could greatly increase 
the reach of these programs and the impact of these programs on the community and housing stability. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. We look forward to working with the council and the administration to ensure uh, that New York City is best able to serve uh, our seniors in need. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning, Chair Drum, uh, Chair Chin. Thank you very much uh, to the committees for holding this hearing. My name is Alex Riley. I'm the director of the elder law practice of the civil practice of Legal Aid Society. The Legal Aid Society is the nation's largest nonprofit law firm uh, handling about 300,000 matters every year. I'm joined today by my colleague Chris Evans, who's a, a retired uh, British solicitor, if I got that right, um, who volunteers out of our Brooklyn office for the aging. Uh, and the only work that he does with us is uh, assisting clients uh, applying for and, and renewing their scree and dree benefits. He's done many hundreds of these, and uh, in a moment, I, I hope he'll, hope he'll uh, share a couple of thoughts that he has, uh, has uh, having been on the front lines for several years with us. Um, so I agree with everything my, my uh, colleague Pete Kempner just said, um, uh, including with respect to his last point about redeterminations, I, and I will mention that in a moment. Uh, one thing I should say is that the, uh, the packet of materials that uh, I prepared for the committees I uh, shouldn't worry that this is all testimony. It's actually just a few pages of testimony, but uh, the, the uh, attachments are uh, a couple of the SCREE forms at issue, because in my testimony I make reference to particular aspects of them, and also a copy of the comments uh, that I submitted to the Department of Finance last month with respect to their proposed rules. Um, so generally speaking, we have been uh, fairly pleased with the way the Department of Finance has administered uh, these programs over the last several years. Um, we're very pleased to hear that they, they've developed this portal that's going to be coming out, I guess, in several months. Uh, they created a print guide. Um, they've been generally responsive to us when we make specific requests on behalf of clients to sort of fix problems. I mean, generally speaking, we've been pleased with the work that they have done, but we um, we do have some areas uh, in which we recommend improvement. Uh, first thing I'll mention is uh, what uh, Mr. Kempner mentioned with respect to redeterminations and that uh, Council Member Chim brought up before. Um, it appears the Department of Finance has the ability to identify cases where the scree beneficiary or DREE beneficiary is entitled to a redetermination. So why the onus is on the uh, older disabled person to uh, apply for this is, is a mystery. And it, that's not the only problem. In addition, as Council uh, Chair Chin mentioned before, uh, there's virtually no publicity about this. I mean, uh, Chair Chin herself didn't even know that this option existed until quite recently. And, and this is not surprising uh, because if you Look at, for example, uh, one of the representatives of the Department of Finance earlier mentioned that uh, I believe that the redetermination uh, concept is mentioned in the, in the FAQ section. Well, um, first of all, the initial rent freeze program application doesn't mention redeterminations at all. So when you first apply for the program, you have no idea, if you read the application and all of its information, that if your income uh, reduces by 20 percent or more in the future, that redetermination is an option. So it, the redetermination is discussed in the long-form renewal application, but uh, it occurs on the very last page of the 13-page application packet. And the question, the FAQ that appears there does not say, what if my household income drops? What it, and that should be the question. What it says is, what are my options if I have a permanent loss of income? The rule says that you get a redetermination if your household income drops. So the, the, the frequently asked question, the way it's phrased, is totally misleading. So the, uh, the information should be included in the initial application prominently should be more, much more prominently placed in the renewals, and the frequently asked questions should be rephrased. By the way, the short form renewal application, which we applaud DOF for having created, does not mention redeterminations at all. So if you don't know about it, how on earth would you know to apply? Um, 
In any event, as uh, P. Kemper mentioned, really, you know, it shouldn't be, no matter how much publicity it is done, uh, the redetermination should not be uh, required as an application by the beneficiary, the Department of Finance should be able to handle this um, without uh, initiation by the, the, the applicant or beneficiary. Council Member Chin had a number of queries, I believe, for the Department of Finance, uh, some of which are included in my written testimony uh, of, around this. We'd be interested to know how many redetermination applications did the agency receive, how many did they approve uh, of those that were rejected, what were the reasons, uh, what was the average reduction in tenant to pay amount that occurred following successful redeterminations? Uh, and why is it that the Department of Finance uh, does not take the initiative on its own to, uh, to process these without an application? Next, we think that the, uh, the Department of Finance should do a better job educating um, uh, screen and three beneficiaries and applicants about the definition of household. So the household includes anyone rel uh, related to the tenant who lives in the apartment. It does not include a boarder, somebody who is uh, paying rent to the, the primary tenant. And as we know, uh, housing is so expensive in the city, in order to stay in their apartments, many older people uh, bring in a, a boarder, a roommate. Um, but uh, the, there's a lot of confusion around this, and you'll notice that um, the definition of household does not appear anywhere in the application itself. It does appear in the frequently asked questions uh, section, but if you just look at the application, definition is not there at all. In addition, um, if you look at the first page of the application, the, question, the, the reference to uh, sort of implied reference to household is the following. This, this question appears at the very beginning. Was the combined income for everyone living in your apartment less than $50,000? That's the wrong question. Because if you have a roommate in your apartment who makes $100,000 a year, but only pays you $300 a month in rent, DOF only counts that $300. DOF doesn't care how much the roommate makes in income, but this question would lead you to believe that it does. So that is a question that really ought to be revised. Um, in a moment, uh, I believe Chris Evans will talk about um, the, the renewal process and uh, challenges that older and disabled people have, even with using the short form. Um, so I, I won't steal his thunder on that. I will make very, one very, very minor point, which appears as a footnote in my testimony, um, to Councilmember uh, uh, Vallone's point about powers of attorney. The, the SCREE documents, all the forms actually get the terminology wrong. They keep referring to a person as a power of attorney, but there's no such thing as a person who is a power of attorney, it's an agent. So the, the DOF, if it's gonna revise its forms, they might as well actually get the, the terms right. Um, Finally, with respect to uh, the uh, proposed rules that uh, were, were uh, uh, there was a hearing about this uh, at DOF a, a couple of months ago. Uh, won't go into um, all those details, but uh, the last attachment to written testimony uh, that I've submitted includes um, the comments that we submitted to the DOF on that. One of the most concerning aspects of those proposed rules is that whereas for many years, the uh, screw DRE beneficiaries' rent would be frozen at the amount in effect prior to the time of application. What the DOF has proposed is that the, uh, that uh, rule be eliminated and that the uh, rent be frozen at the rent currently in effect. We have no idea why they did this, but this would make uh, over time a substantial difference in the actual amount of benefit that uh, uh, an applicant would receive from the program because the frozen rent would actually be higher. So uh, if I could ask um, Mr. Evans to talk a little bit about his frontline experience uh, with applications and renewals. Uh, thank you to the committee and to Chair Drum and Chair Chin for allowing me to speak. I would say that uh, I endorse all the comments made by Alex Riley. Uh, my first experience of getting involved was as an outreach worker with Community Service Society. Um, and more recently, I've spent now six years assisting through the Legal Aid Society and more recently at Camber Legal Services in Flatbush. So I have quite a wide, ra wide range of uh, clients come to see us. Um, I've handled over 700 applications in Brooklyn. 
alone. So, and for a number of those people, it's, English is not their first language. So my experience of that, I would say, about renewals in particular, I think uh, on first applications, people tend to have assistance, legal advice or assistance. A lot of people, when they do renewals, do not have any assistance unless they're uh, fortunate enough to find their way to uh, one of the advice centers, such as the ones I assist at. But um, <coughs> we were given some evidence by the Department of Finance uh, personnel earlier <coughs> that although the numbers of people receiving the benefits are increasing, I think they said 20%, they pointed out that there was obviously people are dropping out of the scheme also. And I think that's my main concern. They said people dropped out for reasons of death, moving accommodation or increased income. Um, I'm sure those are all true. I would say my experience is that failure to provide documents is the single largest reason why people are coming off the scheme. Because if they, if they aren't helped <coughs> with advice to explain to them what they need to provide and to understand that and to interpret the questions sent by the Screen Injury Office, the Department of Finance, um, sometimes they just can't cope with the process and they're not uh, receiving any other legal assistance um, from anyone else. Um, some of the questions raised by this, the Department of Finance are formulated in a way that are frankly challenging. They are, they are standard response text included in the forms, difficult to read, and often they say things like produce all the IRS returns for all members of your household. And this, these questions are sent to people who do not file IRS returns regularly or at all because they're not obliged to. So they, they don't know what to do, they panic, should they go and do an IRS return, whatever. And I find a lot of people need hand-holding through that process on the very basic level. And as a result of people being denied screen, coming off the screen for failure to provide documents, um, I'm now handling more and more appeals to the Department of Finance to get people back onto the screen injury system um, because they've been timed out, literally, for failure to provide something that they didn't know what they had to provide or how to do it. Um, so I would simply say that in practice there are quite a lot of problems despite overall, as I say, uh, our, we, we do consider the Department of Finance uh, has made useful changes in the format of its forms and its process, but it is still very much a time critical process. You apply, um, they send a letter, you have to reply to it. If you don't, they send another letter, then they time you out. And it just says you have failed to comply with the process. It doesn't actually say what you failed to do. So it is quite a challenging process for seniors, particularly as they get older, less able to read, less able to uh, even open and deal with mail as I say, particularly for those whom English is not their first language. And I uh, would uh, invite the committee to uh, make a point of addressing that in any submissions. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, Council Member Vallone has some questions. Thank you to the panel. Um, we always appreciate your comments and look to those for future clarification bills. I think we have some really good ideas there and I'm happy we'd all work with you to do that making the forms as, as clear as possible it can only help. Uh, I think we all struggle with just about any form that comes out of a city agency, so uh, we thank you for that aid. Although I would give you as a point of reference not to mention that Chair Chin doesn't know something. There's not anyone in this council that knows more about than Chair Chin knows about uh, on aging, so I always defend you to that, Morgan. If she doesn't know it, then it's the agency's fault for screwing us up in the first place. Uh, that's what I say. But I also, Peter, love the idea of extending the protections to the unregulated apartments. I believe that's the unsung story of what's happening now to our seniors and pretty much everyone that is struggling to remain in an apartment. Uh, if we truly want to make a dent and stop homelessness and stop the senior crisis, then we need to extend these protections of screen injury to everyone. Uh, and if we're going to look at budget priorities, this is one that will have an impact and a lasting impact on the city. Um, and I think that's something we should really take a look at. So I just wanted to make those couple of comments and, and support our chairs. Thank you very much. It, it, and can I say in response to that, if you look at some of these neighborhoods that were talked about that were being underserved by, by screen injury, a lot of these are neighborhoods with two, three family homes that wouldn't otherwise be covered. Exactly. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Council Member Chen, uh, Chair Chen. <laughs> Thank you. Council Member Below, I really did not know. <laughs> 
because I don't think it was in the outreach materials. Um, so I'm glad that now we all know that there is a redetermination process. Um, and I thank you all for your, your advocacy and your great work. Um, I think some of the points that you raise about how we can really simplify you know, the application and making sure people understand. I mean, even the whole idea about the household income and, the, and roommates, and I think we really have to work together uh, to make sure that that correct information get out there so people know that they can qualify um, and they should apply and really getting the assistance um, that they need. Because every year, I think all the council members, we get a list uh, from the council, which is, comes from the Department of Finance, to tell us who are of our constituents didn't renew. And we spend time calling them to find out, yes, some passed away and, and some you know, didn't um, fill out application or they didn't have the documentation that they need. Uh, but we gotta make sure that the renew process um, is easier so that people can continue to get the benefit. And one thing we will advocate with um, DOF is like, why do you have to wait, you know, to be in the program for so long to entitle you to a short renewal form? So we should really get them to uh, kind of shorten that time, that once you renew, then you should be able to continue to use the short form and to get the, um, the explanation clearer. I think that's something that we can definitely continue to advocate for. And thank you all for your great work. Uh, yes, and we'll um, follow up with the uh, questions about redetermination as well when we uh, write to the administration after the hearing. So thank you all for coming in, and we're going to bring up our next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Parvati Devi and Larry Wood. When we get started, I know there's going to be a third panelist and we'll introduce her after she fills out the form, but we might as well just get started now. Okay. Uh, good, af good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, testify. Uh, my name is Larry Wood. I'm a director of organizing at Goddard Riverside Community House. It's a settlement house on the Upper West Side. Um, and we operate several senior centers and org programs, home delivered meals, a variety of senior services, and a lot of other services to our community as well. Um, as you know, and was re referenced earlier today, the Housing Justice for All Coalition fought and uh, we won significantly stronger rent laws last year, which was great uh, to help preserve affordable housing, um, uh, stop inordinate rent increases, vacancy allowances. But if you currently have a rent, high rent burden, nothing last year changed for you. You're still a danger of homelessness, uh, a medical crisis, an emergency of some sort, and um, as has been referenced earlier by others, uh, seniors who enter the SCRE or disabled men and women who enter the DREE program have their rents frozen at the level they enter the program. Many of them entered at really high rent burdens. Pavati, who is a senior active on the Upper West Side in her packet, there's a New York Times article in there uh, profiling five tenants who have really high rent burdens. Pavati is one of them, Kay is another. Um, they were both seniors I've worked with. Kay is now homeless. She was spending more on her rent than her income. Her rent was frozen, but it was just a matter of time before she lost her home. And now she's in the shelter system. 
Um, this is something that has to change with SCREE. Uh, we, we talked a little about recalculations, um, but there's been uh, examinations that looking at new legislation that would roll back the rent so seniors were not paying more than a third of their income toward um, Th their, their rent. It's critically needed. It needs to be priced out. I understand it would be a, a, an increase of uh, expenses to the program, um, but it could be cost effective at keeping people out of the shelter system. Um, Pavati will tell you about her own particular circumstances. It's there in the Times article. But a, a senior who's living on 20000 a year paying 50% of their income means they have $10,000 a year to live on. A senior making $50,000, or at least having that household income, if they're paying 50%, at least they have $25,000 to live on. So I think we really have to look at the lowest income seniors, those with the highest rent burdens, to get this type of reform enacted first, um, and then uh, to see, really price it out to see if we can make it uniform across the board so everybody's rent can be rolled back to an affordable level um, and keep those seniors in their homes. So I just urge um, a costing out of what this reform could uh, make. And Danny O'Donnell, Assemblymember Danny O'Donnell, has legislation on the state level that he's introduced this year. It's Assembly 8749. We've been in touch with Senator Liz Kruger's office, and we'd love to talk to some council members about sponsoring something on the local level. Thank you. Okay. Very good. I don't know if you stated your name for the record. Can you just do that for me? Sure. It's uh, Larry Wood, uh, Director of Organizing at Goddard Riverside Community House. Okay, thank you, Larry. Thank you. Next, please. Okay. All right. I hope you hear it. I, you can hear it? Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm Parvati Devi, and as a recipient of this program, I thank you for the opportunity to testify. First and foremost, the rent freeze of this program is not enough to keep us in our homes. See the attached New York Times article for details of my own impoverished circumstances. This program needs to roll back the rent to a third or better 30% of a person's income. Other rent subsidy programs work this way and are effective in reducing rent burdens and providing affordable housing. Reforming RE, which I'll explain that in this manner, would be cost effective in keeping recipients with very high rent burdens in their homes and out of the shelter system. Now, um, we need legislation to reform these programs accordingly. To this end, copies of petitions and hundreds of signatures have been collect collected for your perusal. However, not to ignore the way the Department of Finance operates. The Dree Scree application does not contain a box below address, mailing address, if different from above. That needs to be added. Every time I renew, I have to deal with this, and it's a simple thing that can be placed. Uh, my second point is, re should really be the name of this, is all that is needed for the heading. Why you qualify should be inside the application. Disabled people can be highly discriminated against. About 13 years ago, a judge inappropriately asked about my invisible disabilities in court. These labels are something to think about. All you need is re and the reasons for it within. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, please. I'm sorry we the confusion over your... Um no, that's okay. I think it was before we switched rooms. Yeah. I should okay. have checked. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairs Chin and Drum. My name is Alex Brandis. I am the Policy and Advocacy Manager at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today at this oversight hearing examining the administration of the Rent Freeze Program. The Legal Advocacy Department at the Neighborhood House has helped thousands of people from 78 different zip codes receive Rent Freeze Program benefits. As advocates, we have concerns about the recently issued proposed rule for the rent freeze program and adapting the program to ensure people remain eligible in light of changes in state and federal law. Regarding the proposed rule, while we were encouraged by DOF's attempts to make the rent freeze program more accessible in a few respects, we noted several instances where the proposed rule would be more restrictive than current practice. Our principal concerns include requiring documentation that is unnecessary and difficult for clients to obtain, limiting the number of applications a client can submit in a calendar year, financially punishing tenants for 
um, for problems created by their landlords and DOF, prohibiting clients from receiving city FEPs and SCRE simultaneously, increasing the tenant's rent, and incentivizing the landlord to act against the tenant's ability to maintain SCRE. A full description is included in our written comments. Additionally, we are concerned about DOF's failure to provide sufficient notice about the proposed rules to advocates. Um, regarding recent legislation at the state and federal level, the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019 made several changes that have implications for rent freeze program recipients. DOF needs to make changes to ensure tenants have the correct rent, landlords are not receiving excess tax abatement credit, and tenants who qualified based on their legal regulated rent are grandfathered into the program. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 caused the revision of several tax forms, including Form 1040. The new Form 1040 has IRA distributions combined with pensions and annuities. While IRA earnings, pensions, and annuities are accountable income for the rent freeze program, IRA distributions are not. In two cases we are aware of, DOF wrongfully denied clients because of IRA distributions. DOF failed to realize this was not a countable source of income because of the new Form 1040. As there are likely many more than these two clients who have been wrongfully denied, DOF needs to determine which clients were denied based on IRA distributions and retroactively restore benefits. We appreciate the Council's investigation of these pressing matters and are hopeful that with action by the Council, the concerns described can be addressed. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. I think we agree with you about the rent rollback. I mean, Levon's been advocating for this. So if there are state legislation, we can see how we can coordinate and, and to make that happen. And then we heard other testimony this morning. Is there someone I can contact morning. in your office? Yeah, we'll talk afterwards, definitely. We can uh, work on it together Great. with our state elected. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the list of recommendations as well. I was reading through it as uh, you were speaking and I'm still reading and uh, we'll take it into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you everybody. Okay, we've been joined by Council Member Eugene uh, and I believe this hearing is adjourned at uh, 12.37 in the afternoon. Oh, good job. <laughs> yeah, you did work too. Is there something to get this done before one if it was my deadline? Oh, I was wondering <laughs> when you were gonna cry. <laughs>